So uh, the next session is going to be Bitcoin and the ongoing technological explosion in self-hosting. It's going to be presented by Kao Dong, Bitcoin core developer at Chaincode. Please welcome our great speaker. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Carl Dong, and I work for Chaincode Labs, and I'm here to actually talk about just running and using Bitcoin nodes. Hopefully, this is a short and sweet uh, refresher for who, people who are initiated and for people who aren't. Hopefully, you learned something. Um, so if you've been in the space for a bit, you'll have heard the mantra, right? Run a Bitcoin node. Um, but you may ask me, why? Why? Why would I want to run a Bitcoin node? You know, why should I go through the trouble of going through all these long ass tutorials uh, when I can use Bitcoins just fine? Uh, I've got my Bitcoins in Coinbase and you know, they, they work most of the time. Um, well, today I want to explore the reasons why you would want to run a full node, uh, the pitfalls and gotchas of running a full node and sort of a few pieces of technologies that are coming together to make the correct operation of a full node and basically open source software in general more accessible than ever. Okay, so let, let's first talk about why you would want to run a full node. So one of the purported most important value propositions of Bitcoin is that uh, it minimizes the trust that you place in others. Uh, this supposedly means that unlike traditional banking services, you don't need to tr uh, trust anybody to tell you the right balance. You don't need to trust anybody to not create money out of thin air. You don't need to trust anybody to not involve themselves in ris risky speculation with your money. Um, but there's uh, a big, big asterisk there, right? Just because you're using Bitcoin doesn't mean this is always the case. It's not magic. Uh, if you don't run your own full node, you have not really minimized the trust that you place in others. Rather, you have just simply shifted who you trust from banks to businesses, like a custodial service. And this is because custodial services can basically tell you almost anything. Uh, they can do anything that they want with your funds. Uh, and they may even have ideas about the network, which are vastly different from your own. So then how do you reach this promised land of minimizing trust by using Bitcoin? Well, the simple answer is you need a way to see for yourself uh, that there was no cheating by anyone in the history of the Bitcoin ledger. And this is the key insight to why somebody want, might want to run a node. The node is the reason why you're able to transact on the network without placing trust in others. It is truly something that is 100% beholden to you. Uh, think of it as an account, accounting clerk, which works to verify all the transactions on the ledger for you 24 seven. That's special, I think. Um, so if you use a full node for your incoming transactions, you know that under its watchful eyes, there's no cheating by anybody uh, in the history of your coins. You know that any increase in the total supply of Bitcoin was not out of thin air, but according to a well-defined issuance schedule because your node checks that each transaction has less or equal output value than input value, uh, and Coinbase transactions act according to schedule. And you can see here that this is all just code. It's not magic. Um, and if you use your full node, you also know that nobody spent their coins without being able to sign for the transaction with their key or being able to fulfill uh, the spending conditions because your node, again, checks all the signatures and executes the scripts to make sure that they succeed. You also know that nobody spent the same coin twice or is spending a non-existent coin because, again, your node will check it. So, all right, you say, all right, you've, you've convinced me. I'll, I'll run a full node. That's great. I'm glad you're embarking on this journey with me. However, as with any piece of security critical software, the overall security of, of the system uh, depends not only that, that you're running Bitcoin, but how you get the software, how you configure and set up the software, and also how you use the software. So let's talk about obtaining Bitcoin core software. There's actually a very clear spectrum of trade-offs between the amount of trust you're willing to place on others and the ease of getting the software. So if you're a very trusting person, uh, and, and if you trust whoever uploads the Bitcoin binary to our uh, servers, uh, then maybe downloading it from the website is good enough for you. 
uh, if you only trust the signatures that are being uploaded to the servers, then maybe downloading and verifying with uh, a GPG web of trust is good for you. Uh, if you're only comfortable with multiple developers signing the keys, you might want to go, uh, sorry, signing the uh, disk image or, or app or software or what have you, um, then you want to check the signatures in the Gitian.6 uh, repository. Um, and if you think that those developers might be colluding, you can then use the Gitian reproducible builder yourself to reproduce the binaries or you know, just build the binaries yourself. Uh, and if you're extremely paranoid like I am, um, you can, and you think that the Gitian toolchain might be vulnerable, and it, or you don't trust your local systems toolchain, uh, you can use the shiny new Geeks re bootstrappable builds process maintained by yours truly. Um, and, and, and with this process, you can base, uh, the, the main value add for Geeks is that you can track the runtime, the build time, and all of the implicit dependencies uh, that your build depends on right down to a minimal set of trusted binaries, allowing full visibility into where your actual Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin software came from. Okay. So now you've made sure that your downloaded version of Bitcoin is what you intend to use. Uh, deploying it is also a little tricky. Um, if you went and followed tutorials online, it's very likely that you'll get stuck or you'll run into a problem that nobody has run into before or you have no visibility into what you've done after you're done with the tutorial. Um, the difficulties of continual system administration and maintenance uh, stems from a, a few of the following um, basically properties of unix uh, operating systems. Um, and uh, the first one is the file system as a global namespace. In unix operating systems, um, the f uh, there are global configuration options such as adding a user or adding user to a group that you cannot isolate uh, processes from. Uh, another one is that com uh, configuration files in Unix are uncomposable. For example, if you have a Bitcoin node running and a Lightning node running and you want to change the port on the Lightning node, the Bitcoin node has no idea about that. Or if you want to change the RPC port on Bitcoin node, the Lightning node has no, uh, no, no insight into that. You can't refer to values uh, from each other. Uh, and the last one I, I'd like to point out is that uh, Unix systems have no rollbacks or roll forwards, which means that experimentation might put you in a spot where it's unrecoverable from, and you have to like reinstall your system or like true into your current system from your live CD, which uh, sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. Um, so for, you know, fortunately, deployment technology f have really advanced rapidly in the past decade, and they've mostly solved these problems. Uh, and the overall theme of these advancements have been a shift towards containerization and declarative programmatic configuration. So one of these pieces of technology that people are probably familiar with uh, is Docker. Uh, and you know it, it's built upon Linux's namespaces and C groups. Uh, it's basically just a nice wrapper around these two features. Um, and most engineers will have heard of it or used it to just spin up serv services really easily. Um, and it offers, and, and its popularity is not unfounded, right? It offers a way to spin up isolated containers that by their nature of being isolated solves the global namespace problem uh, that we were just talking about. And indeed, you'll see that there are a lot of uh, Bitcoin Docker containers out there for Bitcoin Core, and you can run them on any computer with Docker installed with just one command like so. And so we can take a look at the Docker file for Nicolas Dorier's image. Uh, and what you'll see is that containerization has allowed us to install a whole new user space, right? It, it doesn't really matter if your computer is Fedora or Arch or, or, or whatever. You can now install a Debian user space with its own isolated set of users, packages, and even directories like user slash local, which is normally global. Um, all without affecting or being affected by the host system, right? So this means that deployment scripts don't really have to care about the existing environment, um, and that means that you don't have to you know, run the commands in the same order and account for the differences between the few machines, and I, I think that's pretty cool. Um, so Docker allows us to be declarative with our deployments at the service level, however, Recent advancements such as NixOS and Geek System are helping us be declarative with our service, with our deployments at the system level. 
Um, I think that they are the two forerunners in this uh, in the space, and I think this is going to be uh, sort of the next generation uh, of Unixy operating systems. So compared to Docker, not only can you specify how a service should be built and deployed, more importantly, with NixOS and Geek System, you can programmatically compose services. For example, composing Bitcoin Core with C Lightning and LND, and you can even abstract away common configurations. Uh, if, if anybody set up an HTTPS site, you will know that normal song and dance of adding that dot well-known location to an, an Nginx server and setting up the cron job or the system D timer, uh, all, all, all of that thing that you've probably done like more, more times than you would like to admit in your life uh, is basically abstracted away into one use TLS equals true uh, in, in, in NixOS and Geek system. So aside from this system level configuration abstractions, um, NixOS and Geek System also has this concept of a generation. And generations rep represent the entire configuration of your system, your entire ring zero plus, if you will, right? Including kernel config options, kernel modules, you know, uh, drivers, exact hashes of your softwares and configurations, uh, and and uh, that that's uh, you know that's running on the system and so on. And this this generation is actually what your bootloader boots into. And so each time you reconfigure the system, it generates a new generation. Um, what this also means is that um, if you don't bork the, uh, the bootloader, uh, you can always do rollbacks and roll forwards just from the bootloader. It means that if you end up in a dead end, you can just restart the computer and boot into your last configuration, which I think is very nice. Um, so a demonstration of basically how powerful this all can be can be seen in the Nix Bitcoin project. Uh, and they maintain configuration for a Bitcoin node with outbound connections over Tor, inbound connections over hidden services, uh, a band list loaded, uh, C Lightning connected through Tor, a non-root user set up with the right permissions to use uh, uh, Bitcoin CLI, uh, Lightning CLI, Electrum server, et cetera all for the low, low price of one, you know, one command Nix ops deploy. Um, and so this distillation of an entire system down to a version controlled code base makes, not only makes deployment easy, it also makes it easy for people to collaborate and improve on the deployment's robustness, security, what have you, right? Like try doing that with, a, with normal Unix commands. Okay. Uh, so with your node up and running, it is now time to actually start using it. Uh, I think a big misunderstanding that people have is that just running a node helps the network. Uh, there are some big fat asterisks to that as well. Um, while it is true that uh, unreachable nodes can help bridge the network, they only help bridge the network in very specific scenarios where you're basically the only node that's con uh, that 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 is connected to two parts of the network that is being partitioned. Um, also, uh, people think that you know, nodes can help other nodes, IBD. That is very true, but I think it's very unclear right now that uh, we're lacking in IBD bandwidth. I think most of the slowness with uh, IBD right now is still with uh, verification. Um, and so most, like, most likely than not, unused nodes are left unattended and unmaintained on slow hardware, and that can actually slow down block propagation. Uh, also, quite obviously, uh, simply running a node doesn't magically validate your transactions or integrate with your wallet or any of that. It's only when a node is being used to transact and judiciously validate your transactions that it fulfills its promise of helping reduce the need for trust. So, um, so one of the first things that you need to do, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, if you want to start using your node, is you want to make sure that your node is reachable from the public internet. Uh, if you have a nice ISP which hands you a full IP and you control your gateway router, then you just port forward to your full node to make it reachable. Uh, however, a lot of people um, Aren't, aren't in that situation. For example, if you're in a campus network or if you're in a network where you don't control the gateway router, uh, then you have to do fancy tricks like uh, NAT traversal. Also, uh, ISPs across the globe are deploying CGNAT now, which uh, means more people will have to do this. 
Um, so tricks like NAT traversal can be done through uh, Tor. If you create a hidden service, it can be uh, accessible from anywhere. Um, or you can use uh, more newfangled technologies uh, like WireGuard, which operates uh, over UDP. Uh, it doesn't do NAT traversal out of the box, but uh, by the by nature of operating over UDP, it's more amenable to techniques like uh, stun or turn, uh, which allows you to do NAT traversal. And I believe there is an example of how to do this in the contrib folder for WireGuard. Um, so talking in, in talking to your full node, uh, for the command line savvy, uh, there's Bitcoin CLI, which interacts with your Bitcoin node over JSON RPC. This is sort of the most native experience you'll have, and you'll probably get some new features really early if you, if you know how to use Bitcoin CLI. Does require a little bit of knowledge with how to you know, wrangle with JSON output. Um, and for a lot of people who use Electrum, which seems to be you know, quite popular and actually works with a lot of hardware wallets as well, you want to run an Electrum like sidecar service. Uh, you can Google for like Electrum X or Electors or Electrum Personal Server. Um, uh, and, and so if you run this server, uh, service with your Bitcoin node and point your Electrum app to that sidecar service, uh, then, you, then you'll be, you know, uh, Although Electrum is an SPV wallet, you'll actually be using your own full node to fully validate. Uh, and by the way, the default uh, behavior, I think, for Electrum is to just connect to uh, 10 random nodes. People can connect me, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and so it's much better to connect to your own full node. OK, so um, that, that's all I have to say. Um, th so with that, you, you will have a Bitcoin node set up and hopefully uh, take more uh, you know, take more control of your financial life. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. we have uh, some time for some questions. If you guys want, please line up on the microphones. I'm sure you covered this throughout your talk, but okay. what between NixOS and Geeks, like if I wanted to be doing everything you're describing, would I install NixOS and then use the Geeks package manager, package manager instead of the Nix package manager? Uh, so uh, I think they do the same thing. So you can use yeah. either or. So you, you basically install NixOS and do the NixOS way, or you would install Geeks and do the Geeks way. Okay, and Ge but Geeks goes way further back to like that the very small bootstrap. Yes, right, exactly. Uh, so, uh, 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 yes, so geeks can do the bootstrapping thing. I think there's a bootstrapping path being worked on for NixOS, um, but I don't think that's uh, fully thought out yet. Okay. Yeah. Cool, thanks. Does the Raspberry Pi 4 change the economics or uh, make a, a difference in how, how many people might be doing this? Um, so I, I think there were a lot of people running nodes on Raspberry Pi 3s already and even Raspberry Pi 2s, and I've seen people run lightning nodes on Raspberry, <laughs> Raspberry Pi 0s. <zeros. laughs> um, uh, of course, the... Um, how well maintained those nodes are, are I, I think, somewhat questionable. Um, I, and, I, and I think um, one of the things that people have to um, keep in mind when running uh, Bitcoin nodes on alternative architectures is that uh, there, there's not uh, as many, as much testing on these alternative architectures. Uh, and I'm, I'm mostly talking about, you know, uh, uh, libgcc, you know, libstud C++, and all of, all of these things. We have no idea, sort of, perhaps it can introduce consensus bugs if you're, if you're running there, not that, you know, we, we, we expect that to be the case. Um, so I would say uh, pr if you're running production hardware, perhaps run on x86 is my personal suggestion. Hi, uh, I'm just wondering if there are any security risks with uh, running a node on your home network, you know, with your regular IP address, uh, kind of putting it out there that, you know, you have Bitcoin running with potentially no proper security measures in place. Um, yeah, I would, you're, you're, you're talking about like, 
making it be known to the world that you're running Bitcoin or? Uh, yeah, or just through running it, you know, your, your computer will be discoverable on the network. Um, I'm just wondering in terms of any kind of uh, attacks that that could open up. Yeah, um, so, uh, well, that, that was one of the points about um, uh, potentially uh, even un unreachable nodes. Yeah, we were trying to make a point about uh, unreachable nodes being able to bridge the network. Uh, and if you don't expose your port, you're unreachable, which means perhaps you are less discoverable by the network, which means perhaps it, you're less susceptible to attack. Um, that, that, that might be the case. Um, but I think, um, you know, most, I, I would hope most routers implement port forwarding correctly. Uh, it doesn't seem like too hard of a thing to do. Uh, and I, I would hope that, um, you know, th there's no remote execution vulnerabilities in Bitcoin that, that can allow um, attackers to hack your network or whatever. Okay, thanks. Yes, yeah, so I've run a, a Bitcoin um, a full node uh, without opening the port. And it appears to work, but uh, what are the consequences of doing that? Oh, without opening a port? Oh, without yeah, a, yeah, with yeah, it yeah, being yeah, yeah. I was, I was uh, a hotel Wi-Fi. I can't open port eight three three three. Yeah. Oh right. Uh, well, you just you just won't have any uh, in incoming uh, connections. You only have outbound connections. So it still works. So I mean. Oh yeah, no. Uh, it, it, is that it, it, for for you? Yes, it will work. It, it, I mean, obviously, it works for me. Yes, but exactly. I'm yeah, not contributing yeah. much to the network. Or I mean, what's the um, What's the impact? Uh, yeah, I, I guess you're just not. Um, so if if it, it, you can sort of think of it's not an exact metaphor. You can sort of think of it as sort of like the um, cedars and leachers kind of uh, 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 analogy for uh, for, for BitTorrent. Uh, like everybody, if everybody in the world did that, then uh, that would be bad. But you know, yeah. it, for you, probably not a lot of consequence. <laughs> Hey, do, do you know exactly what Nix and Geeks is bootstrapping from? What's the trust base? Because I, I can't remember the name, but there's a project to create a very uh, small yeah. bootstrapping. So, uh, yeah, uh, so the, uh, the, the the project is uh, stage zero. Yeah, uh, that's it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so uh, very shortly, uh, it, it, uh, stage zero is a hex assembler, which knows how to output like very, uh, like basically take in, take in hex and then output like the actual uh, code uh, and then it, it basically bootstraps like a minimal C and then it bootstraps C with macros and then it just basically bootstraps all the way up to GCC. TCC to GCC and, and all the way up to a, a full computer which takes a lot of time. <laughs> and <laughs> right now is Nix close to that and they're going in that direction or what exactly do you trust? Uh, what's the trust base when you start using the Nix OS Geeks uh, part? Are you trusting uh, the uh, a version of GCC or? Right, uh, so I think for geeks right now, the trust base is about uh, 100 megabytes, which is not great, but it's the best that we got right now. I think for Nix, it's still at uh, two to 300 megabytes. I think for uh, the uh, Ubuntu Docker image, it's like a whole gigabyte, so, you know. <laughs> um, so, so, so we're getting there, and sort of uh, w what it is is um, uh, uh, the current progress is sort of uh, the geeks people trying to build down from what they have and the stage zero people trying to build up from what they have and hopefully they'll meet in the middle somewhere and then we'll have a full bootstrap path from 500 bytes upwards. Great, yeah. thanks. Um, I like to use the uh, Ubuntu package manager to keep like the software updated yeah. and there used to be the uh, PPA, I guess from Matt Corello, um, with right. Bitcoin Core, but it's not updated anymore. Do you know something about this? Is it a bad way to keep the software updated? Uh, I don't know the politics of this. I'm going to assume from Matt's temper that he just got bored of maintaining that. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I, I think um, I think it would be a, a very good opportunity for anybody who you know uses Ubuntu or something like that to you know go through just the normal builds process, right? Like uh, in short, autogen, configure, and make. You know, like do the three commands, and uh, in, in the future, it'll probably ease your way into like if you want to try to make a change to Bitcoin or anything like that. Thanks, Charles. Thank you. Thank you.